Okay, welcome. Um, uh, Please to introduce uh, Sherry Howard, um, the author of um, Art with Heart. And um, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and um, what you do, how you started collecting art. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I'm a former, uh, I guess, former retired journalist. I was a journalist for about 30, 30 years and I uh, worked, my last job was on the online desk at Philadelphia Inquirer. I have been a reporter, I have been a signing editor, I have been a newsroom recruiter, I have been a copy editor, I've been a features editor. So I had all kinds of jobs as a newspaper uh, uh, person. And I had, I really had gotten into art, especially African-American art before leaving the inquiry. I wanted to uh, have you know, beautiful art on my wall, just like everybody else. But I, I particularly wanted to find African American veteran artists, the Lois Lume, Lois Manu Jones, and the um, Romare Bearden, and the and Charles White. You know, these were the one artists, African American artists, who came up at a time when they were basically ignored by the white mainstream mainstream uh, art industry, and uh, I just wanted their works. And in the process of doing that, I realized that, you know, I just bought works of people who I love. And I ended up finding a lot of local artists. And, and that's one of the things I really encourage people to do, Where, whether in Philadelphia or any place else, look for those artists in your community, either, you know, young contemporary artists or some of the older veterans, their works. Unfortunately, some of them are not around, but they, they were people who, especially Black people, a lot of them were black men, you know, worked at the post office during the day, you know, did their art on weekends and at night. And so you want to get to know those types of people who struggle while they did their art. And they did their art because they loved being artists. Uh, and, you know, and, and I bought my, I remember, I bought my first piece at uh, an art auction at the Afro-American Museum in Philadelphia. I had never been to an art auction before. And I was timid, you know, that was before I started going to mom and pop auction houses. And uh, the art in my book and, and most of the art in my collection are from mom and pop auction houses. These are auction houses that are owned by, that could be owned by you or me. They're owned by people who, some of them inherited from families and some of them, you know, just decided that they wanted to do auction. But they are community people that live in the community and they run their auction houses. So we call them like mom and pop stores. These, I call them mom and pop auction houses. And that's, like I said, that's what my uh, collection is made of. But the first auction was not a mom and pop. And like I said, it was the Afro-American Museum and some artists had done some works uh, uh, for them. And the first piece, then the piece that I bought is one that I still really, really love. I'm gonna show it to you. Uh, can I get a share, share screen? I want to show them this beautiful Mo Brooker. Mo Brooker is a Philadelphia artist. Went to the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, like several others. And that's one, and that's one of the things that I found too is I, this is by Mo Brooker, it's uh, an abstract. And, and uh, you know, one of the things I find in my research was that there were several African-American artists, and uh, some of them I have in my collection, who, uh, at least one in my collection, who uh, attended the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. And the Academy, like most art schools, you know, weren't you know, great on uh, accepting uh, Black students, not a lot of them at a time. There are many, that I, in fact, I came across one who went to Patham in the mid 1800s, and we know that at, uh, Tana went to Papa and he had a very, very hard time there because students, you know, uh, made it very, very difficult for him. He was there in the late 19th century, but in around 1950s, 60s, there were several uh, African-American artists who attended uh, Papa and Mo Brooker was one of them. But I love this piece because I love color and I got a chance to actually meet Mo Brooker at an at a African-American art exhibit at the Philadelphia Museum of Art about six or seven years ago. I ended up interviewing him. And also uh, I uh, did a blog post on him because 
he he's just this very, very vibrant artist, just like the color you just saw in his his piece. He's very, very vibrant and he loves color. He talked about why color is so important uh, to him. That was the first piece, you know. And then after then, I just I started going to auction. And I don't know if you've been to an auction before, but auction going to auctions uh, to me initially was like going to galleries. You know, you don't think you have a, enough money to be stepping through over the threshold of, of a gallery. And so you're very, very timid. I was very, very timid when I, I started going. Uh, but then I, I also, I was timid because I'm also coming from a, a more professional uh, background. You know, the people who I was used to were newspaper people, journalists, you know, they were, they were people who had degrees and you know, and uh, and and can consider themselves professional. And a lot of people who I found at the uh, auction houses, mom and pop auction house, these were dealers. These were people just like the artists I was looking for. These were people who did this for a living. And and they weren't buying art. Let, let, let me make that clear. They were not just buying art. They were buying everything that everybody else throws away. And so at one point, I, and I also were doing the same thing because I also sold items on eBay. But what I did in my blog, auction finds, in addition to buying art, African American art, all kinds of art, I was buying history from the auction tables too. And I was writing about that history in the same way I was writing about the artists who I came across. So I, so my going to auctions was, was, had a dual purpose, to unearth history, especially African American history. Because you know, I, I've collected some wonderful uh, historical books as well as my artwork and some historical artifacts also. Uh, I didn't buy everything I wrote about, but I wrote about them because I was just intensely interested in history. And now I sort of call myself an, an accidental, you know, collector and accidental historian because, you know, I don't have a degree or a PhD uh, in history or African American history. All the history that I wrote about came from experience, came from the auction table, came from what people like you and me would buy. And, and unfortunately for me, people would toss so that I could buy and I could write about. It. Would you want to tell everybody about how to go about finding some of these mom and pop auction houses? Yeah. That's a good question. Everybody asked me that. And I tell them that, that I'm going to show you. Because when I mention it, uh, people have uh, right here, uh, auctionzip.com, A U C T I O N Z I P, auctionzip.com. And auctionzip.com, you know, uh, you go in, you uh, type in your zip code, and it would tell, it would give you a calendar of all the auctions that are coming up within your area. I usually say, you know, auction within 30 miles of where I live because I have driven, I would drive an hour to an auction is something that I want. And some of the auction houses that I go to are an hour away, some of you know, 20 minutes uh, away. But with auctions, you will find auctions near you. And those, those auction pages give you a, a link to the auction's website. So if you have, you want to, you know, see what's there. You want to, to go through the experience of going to an auction house. All you have to do is, you know, go to the website, you know, find out when they have an auction coming up. And one of the things you always do, and I always did, I would always preview the items they were going to sell. This has gotten a lot easier now with the web. Before I first started, you know, I didn't have my little cell phone where I could look up things and see what it was and how much I should spend on it. But that's very, very easy now because of the web and the fact that most auction houses do have, majority of them do have websites. And another thing I tell people too, if you have an item that you aren't sure about and you wanna know the price of, there are auction houses and they have this information on their website that hold like monthly uh, appraisal sessions. And it's almost like, you know, they would look at, look at your item and they would tell you what it's probably worth. And what you find at these auction houses are experts in various fields. And those people can tell you just by looking at it. They probably know what the item is and they can tell you, give you some idea of how, what it's worth. But you can also do that yourself by just Googling 
uh, and the item, and if it's a, uh, let's, let's get back to the art. If you have, you can decipher the artist's name. You know, sometimes that's very, very difficult to do too. You can decipher the artist's name, you can plug in the artist's name and you can find out where uh, their items have sold and how much they sold for because there are sites like live auction years. And this will come up when you Google uh, that will, that uh, co congregates all the auction houses and when they have auctions. And so you can see the results of their auctions and how much people pay for items. Another thing to remember, what you see is what someone was willing to pay for that artwork or item at that given point in time. It doesn't mean that you, when you know you you saw something that sold for five thousand dollars a day, that mean must mean that my item uh, can sell for five thousand uh, if I take it tomorrow. Uh, you know, a month later. Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. I like to say, but it, it depends on who wants it at a given point in time. But it does give you some idea of what it's worth. You know, worth five thousand dollars rather than five hundred dollars. And, and if I could bring the library into this, um, yeah. we do subscribe to um, Ask Art, which is one database that lists auction prices here in the art department at the free library. Um, you can access some information for free online, but to access the full records with the sale prices, you can always call the art department. We'll look an artist up for you. You can come in in person and um, log on using um, our subscription. And uh, we also have books uh, that collect artist signatures, but of course, it's they're only so limited. So there's always more research to be done. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Ask Art because I didn't mention Ask Art when I said that you... I can go and find some of this stuff online because Ask Art wants you to pay for their information. So you're looking for stuff for free because you know you're just Googling to find out information. So it's very, very good for me to know that the free library will give me access to you know all of the documentation of, of, of what artwork sold for uh, on Ask Art. And there's several like that. Ask Art was just one of them. And you'll find out when you start to Google. And you want to you, uh, ask art is going to come up and when you click on it and they'll give you one page of information but if in order for you to click further to get more information they're going to ask you to log in sign in and you have to pay for it so uh so so i you one of the things i'm very very happy about uh, uh with alina is that i'm happy that i found her because i didn't realize that the library has so many resources that are available uh to me and I, in fact, I mentioned to her when I first came to Philadelphia, I learned about the Pyramid Club, which was a club from the, 19, it started in the 1940s, and I think it went into the 60s, that held exhibitions of African-American artists, uh, not only in Philadelphia, but uh, throughout the country, usually on the East Coast. And so when I found out about the Pyramid Club, they, they, they also produced a catalog with their exhibit. And I found, I took a look at my first catalog is a little, you know, on about eight pages at, at the art department at the Philadelphia uh, Free Library. And fortunate for me at one of my auctions about probably 10 years later or more, uh, maybe even more, I, uh, I actually was able to buy a, a, another copy. I think this was one from like 1947 uh, from one of the Pyramid Club exhibitions. And you know, and it almost was used at an, an exhibition at the Whitmer Museum in 2015-2017, uh, uh, an exhibit they had on African American art artists. They didn't use that particular uh, catalog, but I'm going. I want to show you two pieces of mine that was that was in that exhibition. One, Columbus Knox. Columbus Knox is a Philadelphia artist, and I, and I I had to fall in love with this piece because you know you know it's a religious piece. You know I see myself as more spiritual than religious. But when I saw it, I I I, I later fell in love with it because I it is it, you can see the movement in this uh, uh, painting, and this is a watercolor, uh, and you can see, you can almost hear the women singing. And I and it's untitled. It doesn't have a title. You're going to see untitled on several lines because sometimes artists don't give titles to their pieces. And so, uh, what uh, galleries and art houses would do? They
they would just, you know, describe what's in there. And what, for me, it's like three women rejoicing. It's obvious that they are rejoicing. Columbus not P. Knox is another Philadelphia artist. Uh, and uh, other, that's one piece that they, that was used in the exhibit at Woodmere. Another one is by, was by Samuel J. Brown called The Odd Sister. And I, this is what no, I picked up at auction. And I don't know if I just had not, you know, seen this piece of what, but so many times when I would go to auction, you know, auction don't go, you know, smooth, very, very smoothly for people who are waiting. You have to sit there and wait for what you want to appear. So I'm sitting there and I heard the, uh, the auctioneer say that this was a African-American uh, uh, artist from Philadelphia who was a, an educator. He, you know, he taught art uh, in, at uh, one of the high schools, Sam Brown, you know, and that sort of perked me up. I realized that, you know, this is who I've been looking for in terms of African-American artists. Sam Brown, and I got the piece. Uh, I, I don't think I paid a lot of money for it either. And, and that was at a time that, when the dealers who were at the auctions weren't that into African-American art. So I could get very good prices for the pieces that I found. Can't do that anymore because now black sells. So that, you know, if a piece comes up and 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 more and more dealers know now that they and these are white dealers, they more know now that these are African American artists. So they gravitate towards them. They buy them because they know they can sell them at good prices at this particular point in time. So now it's kind of it's very very hard for me to. Um, get the art, the artwork at prices that I'm used to, but you know I'm still looking. I'm still looking. Do you want to share some of your other um, favorite uh, pieces from your collection? Okay. Yeah, I could love to. <laughs> and please, you know, I, I, I hope people will ask questions because I want to make sure that I answer all your questions. But I know, you know, people come for different reasons. Now, this piece, and, you, and this is a piece I have, and I also recorded the uh, auctioneers selling this piece. There's a lot of uh, background noise, so you can barely understand it. So I'm not going to uh, uh, click the audio. But when I saw these two pieces, especially the soldier, I fell in love with the soldier. But, you know, look at him. You know, he, he has this, you know, don't mess with me attitude. Both, in fact, both of them. But he did especially. And, and the thing that struck me was that this piece, these pieces, I think, are like from 19, 1950s. I'm not sure because the artist didn't put a date on them. But for me, this is a Black soldier in 1950, you know, and, and, and back then, Black men weren't supposed to be that daring and the way they, you know, stare people in the, in the face. And he does exactly that. He's saying, you know what? I'm very, very confident. Don't bother me. I'm just here chilling, leave me alone. I love the, and when I first saw the woman, I wasn't that sure about her, but I knew that she reminded me of a cousin of mine who had the same attitude of don't mess with me. And so I was not able, when they first came up, I wasn't able to buy either of them because, you know, Somebody else out there on a phone builder liked them more than I did. And so, you know, what I sort of sit back, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But the, 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 the soldier never came up. But uh, some years later, the woman, uh, the painter, the woman did come up. And I was over, able to buy her for a lot, much, 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 much uh, less than she sold for the first time. Now, this for me is a gem. This is one of my one of my first and the favorite piece on my wall. It's an oil painting by Ed Loper Sr. And I found out the title because I had the, the piece clean and the uh, conservator found on the back the title is tenement number three. So I'm assuming there must be a tenement number one and a tenement number two out there somewhere. But I have tenement uh, number three. And I realized how beautiful this piece was when one night, uh, it, it's right over here in my, in my house, I'm looking at it. But one night, you know, the light was 
uh, out in my living room and there was, uh, my living room was dark and there was light coming in through the uh, dining room. And so it fell on this particular piece. And I realized those light colors where, you know, the, the uh, roof and the brick uh, near her, all those light colors were moonlight. And it was brilliant. It was, I, it was just amazing. And then I realized, you know, that's what, you know, he wanted me to see. You know, at first it just, you know, just a flat picture of one on the background. But the way the light hit it, it made me realize that this was uh, a, a summer day. You know, she probably went out and get a cool breath of uh, air and maybe, you know, talk to a friend uh, below. I expect that there probably were crickets, you know, sounding. And, and this piece just, I did, like I said, I just fell in love with it. And I realized I had a gem on this piece when uh, the other person who had been against me, there was one other person, I stuck in there, I paid, it was like I said, early on, I paid a lot more than I had expected to, to pay. And, uh, and he told me later that he was buying this piece to donate to the Afro-American Museum. So, you know, after then I, I knew that I did the right thing and uh, sticking with this uh, piece by Ed Loper Sr. The people I've talked to, I've talked about have been local artists. Uh, Ed Loper is from Delaware, others are from uh, Philadelphia. Anybody who knows anything about art is uh, familiar with Elizabeth Cat. The woman is an excellent sculptor. Uh, she died a couple of years ago, I think at about like 93 years old. And, but one of the things I love about Elizabeth Catlett and also Charles White and a lot of artists, they also did prints. They did what I call original print, prints, meaning that you know, they had a hand in developing them. They're like not reproduction that you almost went off on a machine. They, they are original, original prints, serograph, lithograph, woodcuts, a line of cuts. And this is a line of cut. It has to do with the process with, you know, there's so many uh, processes that I don't try to figure out what they are. As long as I know, can identify an original print. But this one is called uh, Survivor. And I'll never forget when I bought this one, I just wasn't sure whether who, who, uh, who it was. Because I, I, when I walked into the uh, auction house, I looked at it and I looked at the, uh, actually could understand the uh, signature. It said E. Catlett. And I'm thinking, this can't be Elizabeth Catlett because the print was with a group of other items that weren't worth much. And this was on a day when the auction house was holding its special sale where you know everything is higher. So it should have been over there rather than on the tables with all the other you know, stuff. But I was able to get this uh, because there was only one other person uh, who bid against me. And I think uh, most people didn't realize who uh, Elizabeth Catlett was. So you want me to share more or do you um, want to ask another question? Yeah, we know? actually have a great question or a, okay. a few questions from the okay. audience. Um, okay. So um, this is from Cashel. This is fantastic information. Thank you. How do you organize your collection? Do you research pieces beforehand and how do you go about selecting? I, I buy what I like. I tell other people to do the same thing, to buy what moves you and not necessarily something that's gonna match you. So, uh, because like one of the things I mentioned was that I started out looking for African-American artists that I could buy at a price I could afford. That changed when I came across artists who I love. Uh, I have, you know, white artists in my uh, collection. I have uh, one or two uh, Mexican artists. One is a print by, no, I think, no, that's an original by one of the Mexican, um, a very, very famous uh, Mexican uh, muralist. Um, and, 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 and like I said, the, everything I have here are things that I fell in love with. And I think that's how you should buy. That's how I buy. In terms of, of uh, what was the other part of the question? Um, so I should buy. How, do you, how do you organize your collection? Uh, I don't think I have an organization. You know, I have cataloged them, the pieces just to know what I have. Uh, but uh, in terms of organizing, uh, I don't. 
you know, I, and, and, and I just hang in terms of hanging, so I hang what I like. And sometimes, you know, I will move things around, but there are some pieces I love so much that I never move them. Yeah, yeah I, I, I know you, you mentioned that a few times in your book when something is, is has a permanent location. Yeah, that's, that's I'm, I'm like, yeah, like the Ed Loper has a permanent a place and also uh, Mo Brooker. Uh, and I think you already talked a bit about um, selecting and we'll talk some more about research uh, in a bit. Oh, yeah, right, also, right, there's right. a question uh, about uh, insurance. Do you recommend insurance and in any particular companies? Yeah. You know what? I have a rider on my insurance for my artwork. I, this gets into knowing what your works are worth. My suggestion is that before you buy insurance, make sure that you know what it's worth so that insurance doesn't cost more than what the piece is worth. Same thing with framing. Don't spend you know, a whole lot of money on framing. I know it can be expensive. We got you know, reproduction that's worth $25 a frame with 200. But, um, but yeah, I think that insurance is very, very important. And that gets into also appraisals. I think after you figure out what, what it's worth, by doing the research, you know, by, you know, uh, through the library or through Google, you know, if it's worth $5,000, yeah, you, know, you need to insure it. Uh, and I don't have the names of uh, companies, but I think what you should do is check with your homeowner's uh, uh, insurance company, whoever has your homeowner's policy, and see if they can give you a rider for insurance. One of the things, the problem I, I run into is that a lot of insurance companies do it, but they cut the amount off at like $50,000. If you have less than $50,000, that you're, you're fine. Some of my, my collections probably, were, I know, is worth a little more because I had it appraised 10 years ago. Now I need to have it appraised again, but I need to find, uh, I need to have the appraisal done and appraisals are not cheap. But check your insurance company, see if you can get a rider for your uh, your pieces, but make sure you know what the pieces are worth, so you don't get insurance or uh, uh, pay insurance for something that's not paying worth paying insurance for. Um, we also have questions from um, Alexander. What about art made you go into it, and what made you want to research it? Um, so, you know, you know, it must be the journalist in me, and and also in terms of why art, I love art you know i don't uh i appreciate people who are creative and they they have channeled their creativity through works of art and and, and if it comes to african-american art you know i'm looking for pieces especially if there are images in there that reflect me uh and also i appreciate what these artists especially the older ones had to go through to get their works out there and, and get their works known. So I appreciate the history of it. I appreciate the creativity of uh, artists, black or white. And I uh, uh, create, and I appreciate the fact that, you know, they did what they wanted to do regardless of whether other people appreciate them or not. You know, it's, it's that type of thing where, you know, it, it's innate, you know, you just gotta do it. There's nothing else you, there, there's nothing to, to that would keep you from doing it. And they and you talk to artists, they would say this the same thing. Because I have interviewed uh, several artists uh, uh, about you know why they do what they do. And in terms of the research, that gets back to you know my being a journalist and a writer. And when I and I, I'm very very inquisitive. Uh, it, and, and when I see something that I like, I want to know why this person did it. One of the things I also mention to people is that I'm not an art critic. I am a storyteller. I want to know the who, what, when, and where of getting the journalism of the people. You know, how did you grow up? What made you do this? When did you start, you know, uh, uh, drawing? And look, one thing that Mo Brooker mentioned was that, you know, he started drawing, uh, you know, on the sidewalk. You know, he grew up in Philadelphia. Uh, and, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, people will have, uh, you know, paper and pencil or they, uh, I just interviewed not too long ago, an artist and teacher named Bessie Ruth Bridges. And she was, she taught Barclay Hendricks and James Brantley at uh, 
uh, and, and Ed Jones, who are all Philadelphia artists. And so, you know, she's one of those people who, uh, you know, helped make uh, Barkley, I'm about to say Charles Barkley, Barkley Henderson too, the person that he is. And she's very, very interesting, but, you know, she helped them. She didn't think about, you know, doing it, it uh, uh, for herself. So I had a chance to interview her, you know, and she talked about when she was in the school, you know, she would do the artwork in the, in the hallway when she was in high school and her teachers uh, recognized how uh, talented uh, she was. And now she's 94 years old. And, you know, I just do it, this, it's, this blog post of her. And now she's trying to get her name out there and trying to sell. Her house is full of art. <laughs> And I told her, you need, you need to sell some of this stuff. And so that's what she's uh, uh, trying to, uh, to do now. Um, I just want to say if, if, if everybody has not had a chance to check out Sherry's uh, blog, I just put a link to that in the chat because it's a incredible source of information. And the fact that you are collecting these, um, you're collecting oral histories, you're doing interviews with some of these artists, you're catching them. Um, you know, at, a lot of them have been um, overlooked, uh, neglected. And so mm -hmm. that's, it's, if anyone who's come in late, uh, we're here to uh, let you know about Sherry's book and um, the interview that it contains and this information that you've gathered. It, this makes it such a great um, resource for us to have at the library because we're, we, we look to uh, uh, promote uh, local artists. I think that's part of the question that I missed. Um, uh, that, that was something that Alexander asked about also. Um, so, so why go to mom and pop shops, but also uh, specifically, I mean, you talked about that a little bit, but why specifically local artists? Um, I think you talked about that a little bit too, but if you yeah, want yeah. to. And, and, and local artists, I, I didn't go start out looking for just local artists. I was just looking for African-American artists. And Lizzie Catley, one of the national people, you know, Margaret Burroughs, you know, these are all people in the book, one of those uh, 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 national and international people. And in the, the course of, you know, going to auctions, and um, by the people who, interestingly, the people who turn up on the tables were local artists. And then because, you know, I'm buying what I like, they, uh, I, I was buying local artists. And, and I to start to sort of gravitate towards, the, towards them. Uh, and I'm glad I did because, because in the process, you know, that's when you real, and when I realized that, you know, these are also people who are not the Elizabeth Catley or Romare Beard or the Jacob Lawrence. These are people who were out there, like I said before, doing it because they love to do it. And one of the things that I try to do in my uh, blog post and now in the book is to give these people a presence on the web. Now, if you go to look for a Robert Cromarty, who I had never heard of before, the piece of the, uh, the painting of the soldier and the daring woman who looked like Dorothy Danvers in uh, um, this, uh, the movie just slipped my mind. But you know, those, are, those types of people I felt also needed to have a presence on the, on the web. And so that's one of the things I've always tried to do is I, you know, see a piece that I like, I uh, come back and I spend hours Googling, you know, looking for research, looking for original research, as originally I can, because I might find something that's repeated and uh, over repeated. <laughs> and I, what I have to, what I try to do is find the original source. And I use, I rely a lot on information that I find in books because more than likely these people have done the research. Someone who's written a blog post about it, not me because I did my research, you know, picked it up from somebody else's blog post. But, you know, that's a journalist in me. You always want to make sure your information is accurate. And, you know, and whenever I get a chance to interview an artist or a relative, because some of the people who are in my book, you know, when I got their stuff, they're no longer alive. And, and what happened is that Family members will, you know, search for their relative's name, find my blog post, and they contact me. So I, I get it. It gives me the ability to talk to them about their relatives. I've gotten some wonderful, wonderful stories uh, uh, that way. But the most important thing is putting their names out there so that if you ever come across, you know, a uh, 
uh, a, a piece by someone, uh, hopefully is, uh, you know, it, I have written about it and you'll see it and you, you'll find all this wonderful information uh, about the artist. Um, I think maybe this is a good time to uh, interject a little bit. Um, we had planned to talk a little talk a little bit about library um, yeah, yes, resources, yes. Uh, but then I'll get back to the questions uh, from Georgia too. So I, I, I see those, but I just wanted to quickly share. So uh, we talked about ASCAR and um, databases that list auction records. We also have books um, about auction records. Um, we have newspaper databases, so of course this is a big part of um, Sherry's research. Um, you can access them remotely using your library card. You can um, do a keyword search in the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer going back to 1860. You can now access the Philadelphia Tribune um, through the library website. That's a really, particularly if you're researching um, local African-American artists, it's really uh, important. And we also have this, um, archival collection here uh, that we call the research file collection. So there are uh, actual files. So I just pulled a couple um, of files related to artists um, that Sherry talks about in her book. So here, for example, this is um, Al Hollingsworth. And this oh, is- Oh, yes, AC. This, <laughs> this is just a, it's an oh, exhibit catalog. Oh, yeah. um, um, so this is from 1964. Oh, wow. Uh, and um, is it, yeah. was there a local was there a local exhibit? Um, now I'm now I'm piquing your interest. Uh, <laughs> yes. so I'll, be, I'll be excited for you to come look at this and tell yes. us more about it. Um, it seems like it's it's in New York, the uh, Terry Disenfast Gallery. I don't. Um, wow. Uh, but anyway, this is a piece of um, primary information. So this is what uh, you were talking about. Um, so some some ephemera, um, Roland Ayers, whom you you have that really great right. uh, painting you you right. you flashed in your um, yes. in, in, and it's also in the uh, in the book. So um, here's an exhibit catalog of his work. So this is the kind of thing that. Um, somebody doing the kind of research that you're doing mm -hmm. um, could come and just ask for. Um, mm -hmm. Here's um, a file on um, Edward Loper, we, that great painting, yes. tenement number three of the woman on the uh, fire oh. escape. And here's that exhibit catalog that you said you uh, also have. Oh, um, so, exactly. Uh, really, really useful um, collection here. So this is our research file collection. Um, I'll drop another link to some of this stuff uh, in the chat. So um, come to the um, art department. Um, I've also put together a quick list of uh, books that relate to some of the artists that Sherry's talking about, but really the majority of the artists um, here uh, and also in in your blog have not had a book written about them right, right. that's exactly. that's exactly the point so you're doing that work exactly. and so we we may have a file but otherwise you really have to hunt down that information um, and put it together um okay so uh that that was my spiel about the library <laughs> but, but you know what but let, let me just put uh to reiterate that i will be using the library resources i didn't know all this stuff was there you know at ac hollingsworth i uh, have a piece by him i always and he was a, a uh illustrated cartoonist and i always i can never find a lot of um you know, uh, original information. So it's good to know that you have that. And, and you're saying that it, can that some of that be accessed online or will I have to come in? Which I don't mind coming in because I, you know, I like shuffling through stuff. <laughs> yeah, if, if you're not local, so some the databases can be accessed remotely, although not ask art, but you can call us or email us and tell us which artist you're looking for and give us some parameters and we'll give you, uh, we'll do the search on your behalf. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the for the files, I mean, they're, they're they haven't been scanned. So if you have right. one particular artist you're looking for, we can photograph it and email you a photograph, or just give you a quick description of what's there. So um, I should share our, our email address. It's um, I'll put that in the chat in a minute, um, so you can contact the art department by um, email. Um, yeah, yeah, I would oh. recommend if if you have artists that you you can't find any place you really want to know about it, I, and I encourage you to learn as much as possible about the people who are hanging on your walls. Uh, to me, that enriches the artwork, it, it, it enriches the experience of experiencing them. 
and uh, and and this is a the free library art department is a perfect place to go and I will be hanging out there. <laughs> uh, excellent I, I love it um, what um I feel like there were some great questions here I missed there was a question from uh, Georgia about do you sell um do you sell artwork. <laughs> I don't sell anything. You know, every piece that I bought uh, for myself, I, I is still here. I have friends who buy to sell, but I never do. Uh, but you know, I would also at one point buy artwork to donate. I'm a member of the Philadelphia Association of Black Journalists, and I have uh, pieces now that uh, I purchased specifically to donate uh, to their uh, 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 scholarship fund. You know, we have a silent auction. People. Do, a bid on it and and the money would go to the asylum auction. Uh, I haven't done it for a few years because they basically, excuse me, sort of stop it. So I have my, my the third floor of my house, there's a room devoted purely to artwork. And at some point, like Miss Desi Ruth Bridges, the art teacher, uh, I need to uh, weed it out. Because, you know, some of the, the, the things I have up there are not particular ones that I want to hold on to. Uh, there are some pieces that are, you know, really dear to my heart, but there are others that I could let go very easily. But, you know, that's easily, easier said than done, because we all have houses full of stuff that we don't need, and we just need to find the time to figure out what to do with all that stuff. I'm one of those people. Well, the other question is, how many pieces do you have? So that sounds you know what? Like... <laughs> I only know that because, uh, you know, keep, uh, uh, the local PBS station did a, an interview with me, and that question was asked. So I walked around my house, and I went upstairs. And I have about 200 pieces. I don't have a lot, a lot. I don't think that's a lot, but I have a friend who told me that he has like 2,000 pieces and and you know storage areas, and he's having someone to catalog. So I only have about 200 pieces, and probably 125 or so are ones that I I would keep. Um, finally, uh, the one more question, how do you determine what to bid? Like, I you know, guess, so, how much? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, how much? Yeah, you know, somebody asked me that question, but I go in with a certain amount to spend. I really don't. I, I've been doing this so long. I know what I pay for stuff and what, how much things are worth, or I can figure out, you know, by Googling on my phone how much things are worth. So I don't have a set amount. I'm going in hoping that I can get the best price I can uh, for them. And, and, and like and it has to all it has all to do with knowing what pieces are worth and how much you're willing to pay for them. And I, although like I said, I don't have a set, you know, piece set set number in mind, um, I know it's just, you know, just it, you know, innately know. And I and I and sometimes when I'm bidding, I can tell you sometimes when I'm bidding on pieces, I know that I need to stop, you know. But at, as auction goers, we all know this, but you get so caught up in the bidding and the fact that you know I really want this piece that you it goes out the window. I, let me tell you what that, this is, I, I love this story. I was I love art, you know, paintings on the wall, but I also love artist sketches. Well, I think that sketches are the closest we come to, you know, them sort of thinking out loud. And so Frank J. Dillon is a, a was uh, a African American artist from New Jersey. And so the art, one of my favorite art houses had uh, a, a, a several of his sketchbooks. And so at the auction, I'm there bidding and bidding, and there's someone on the phone. He won't give up. He or she would not give up. And I'm sitting there saying, Sherry, this is going too high. It's 100 bucks. Then it's at 250. Then it's at 300. Then I stepped back and said, you know what? I don't need it that badly. And so I decided you know, to step back, leave it alone. And the person uh, who was on the phone uh, got that. But then, and so I, you know, I'm you know, really, really stressed. And so I go to another room where we have, where they have the box locks. This is the junk, you know, just the stuff in actually in boxes. And so I look on our table and I see this box of uh, books and photographs. And so I pull it out, I take a look at it, and I find, and I find uh, Frank J. Dillon's name on one of the uh, books. 
And there's a book on glass uh, writing, and he does, he also did uh, stained glass. And lo and behold, I'm going through this box, I find three, two or three sketchbook books by uh, Frank J. Dillon. So what did I do? Put the stuff back in the box, push it back on the table, because I didn't want to alert anybody else, because that can happen. And so when it came up, I decided not to ask the auctioneer to pull those out, because when you do that, other people, yeah, other people know all of a sudden get interested. I ended up paying $3 for that box of, uh, and those are some sketches from the, from uh, the sketchbook. And the sketchbook, neither, none of the sketchbook were in great condition, but I, $3 compared to $300. Same, basically the same thing, you know, his sketches. And I found out later after I wrote a blog post about it, that the person on the phone who was bidding against me and got the first group $300 was his grandson. And so, you know, I added his, some quotes from his grand, grandson to, uh, to that blog post. But, you know, things like that happen sometimes. But that was one of the luckiest, luckiest uh, buys that I, that I made. Well, yeah, we have a comment here from somebody. Um, LJ says the print and picture collection here at the Free Library has stained glass drawings from the company Frank Dillion worked for. You're kidding! So, so you haven't have found that, Lena, so I can come and see them. Uh, well, um, the print and pictures collection is. Uh, oh, that's that's one next door. It's, not it's, it's right next door, so I'll put you in touch with the curator. Anybody can make an appointment to to oh, see them. Yeah. yeah, you just need to get in touch with them ahead of time because they're. They don't have um, public lock-in hours as we do. Well, that's um, good to know. I'm glad. Thank you. Thank you. Who's that? LJ? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, everybody, if, if you, I, I mean, if anybody missed this in the beginning, uh, we are recording. So if you, if you don't want to be on as part of the recording, we're reading the questions off the chat, but feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question of Sherry. But I'll just keep reading some of these here because we have some great questions. Okay. Uh, the another question about when you talked about cataloging, when you say catalog your um, your works, what do you mean? How do you do that? Yeah, catalogs primarily, you know, with, with, with your computer, when I did it at that time with pad and paper, with your computer, what you're doing is, is recording the uh, title, if there's a title on there, the name of the painter, uh, the, the artist, if there's a date on it, and you put the date. And also it's a good idea to also measure uh, and, and measure uh, the, the piece. Most of my pieces, I'm quite sure most of yours are in frames. And what you can do, you can either measure, the, well, maybe the thing to do is measure both the picture in the frame and the outline of the picture, you know, without the frame. But that's what cataloging it is. It's primarily keeping a record of the works that you own. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I, uh, I, I didn't recognize LJ as the name of the, of the person asking the question. It's actually, that's a question that, that was a comment from Laura herself, the curator. Uh, Laura oh, okay, Sanders, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so you'll have to get in touch with her via email okay. and in the chat and um, yes. uh, we can Thank get you. in touch with her later. Um, that's yes. exciting. Yeah. Um, so somebody else asked, would you pay more than $5,000 for art you like? Um. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a good question because, you know, I, it's something that I, uh, no, I don't grapple with it, but, you know, I have, I have friends who do pay at least one who pay that kind of money for artwork. And what I explained to him is that I'm not used to doing that. You know, I'm, it's very hard to pay you know, $100 for Survivor by Elizabeth Catlett and $5,000 for the same piece by Elizabeth Catlett. So it's very, very difficult for me to pay that much because based on what I've paid for my pieces in the past. And one thing I learned is that I don't have to own everybody because a, a lot of what I bought was primarily uh, pieces that I like, but also pe people I want to write about. I have, because I have uh, several pieces upstairs that, you know, I, if I could sell them, I would sell them. But I bought them specifically because I like the image and I had never heard of the artist. I'm thinking about two 
uh, white female artists whose pieces were of jazz musicians. And, uh, and you know, the pieces were okay. And one of the women had, um, had an exhibit at the Woodmere in the probably 1950s or 60s. But I thought that she would be, both of them would be very interesting to write about. And so I bought the pieces, you know, probably paid five, 10 bucks for them. Uh, and I bought them specifically to, uh, uh, to write about them. Um, so, yeah, yeah 5,000 is a lot. <laughs> but, you know, but, but let me, one thing I should mention is I mentioned that Elizabeth Catlett, when I, uh, if you remember the Elizabeth Catlett, this one, uh, survivor. Now, that was another interesting story. When I bought this uh, piece, well, before I bought it, you know, I had my phone, I checked to see, well, first make sure her signature, and then to see how much it was, it had sold for. And so, you know, went on my phone, Google, and at the, the time, I've had this piece for about 10 years, it had sold at a New York, art, New York auction house for like $2,500. And I can tell you from, the time I bought the piece over the past 10 years, that thing has gone from $2,500 to like $3,500 to like $5,000. And I think recently or late last year, it went for like $7,500, dollars So you, you, it's very, very hard to know you know, uh, how, how much pieces are going, how much you should pay for a piece. And I only know because I've done this so long, I just know that there are just certain limits that I'm uh, going to get to. I think the highest I ever pay is probably like $800 for, for a piece. And that was not early on. That was when dealers started to recognize that, you know, wow, I can make some money off of black art. So I should, you know, buy and stuff. So that pushed up the prices. And that's the reason why you know, I ended up paying 800 for a piece that, you know, probably 10 years before I could have gotten for a hundred bucks. Well, we also have a comment here that you, you definitely selected some uh, awesome pieces. So your, your collection Thank is, you. yeah. I, you know, I, I think I got, I got very, very lucky. I got very, very lucky. Uh, because I was looking at the uh, work behind your wall and I saw oh, that uh, oh, Romar Bearden and, and you have the uh, shell screen of this. Right, exactly, piece. exactly. And it's part of a series. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And you know what? It's, I got this one from Not a Mom and Pop. I've had it for a long time, but I got it from Freeman. If you're from Philadelphia, you know, Freeman is the oldest uh, uh, auction house in the country. And so, you know, it sells a lot of art. And so I picked that one up at Freeman a uh, few years ago. I always want a Romare beard. It's, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, would you ever use your um, collection as a, like a, would you host classes? Would you, uh, this is just something that occurred to me. Would you have a mini Barnes Foundation? You know, would you have uh, students come in and learn about art but, and, and art history from your collection? Yeah, yeah, I never thought about that. I could do it. Because I, I love to introduce people to some of the local artists that, 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 that I have. And, and young people, especially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, oh, we have hey, another well, question. <laughs> Can we see more oh, pieces? Well, okay, let me let me <laughs> let me do that because you know I was at another uh, at another one of these and people said that oh you didn't show enough artwork. Okay, let me go through the pieces that I have here. I did pull some out. Julius T. Block. Now I mentioned that, you know, when I, uh, uh, I started out with wanting to buy African-American artists, but I also fell in love with this artist. And, and Julius C. Block is a, was a white artist. And I love Julius Block because Julius Block was one of a few people, artists at the time, 40s, 50s, 30s, 40s, 50s, who were uh, uh, white artists, who were drawing black people as black people. They weren't caricatures. One of the worst things about going to auction for me was some of the images that I saw of Black people, especially Black kids, some of it in art, most of it in advertising. 
uh, uh, you know, black kids, you know, they always they had, you know, the, the, the red lips and always had watermelons. They had, you know, they're just cruel things. They're just cruel things. You know, you want to, you know, how, show you how inhumane people can be. But Julius Block was not one of those people. Julius Block was a wonderful artist. He uh, uh, primarily, uh, a lot of the, his works uh, around black people were, you know, positive. One of that, and 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 he was Jew, he, a Jewish artist, and I think he was like five years old in in late nineteenth century when his family uh, came over. I want to read something that he wrote. Jewish Black uh, had an exhibit in a sub in the subway in Philadelphia, and. Some of one of the images were of black people, and he talked about why he hated black people. And, and one of the other things he did too was he did a painting of the Scottsboro Boys, about seven young black teenagers who were accused of raping a white woman in early part of the 20th century. And that was used uh, to raise money. Yeah, yeah, 19, he had a portrait called The Prisoner made in, in 1934 to protest the unfair treatment of the Scottsboro boys. Nine young black males falsely accused of raping two white women in Alabama in 1931. But this is what he said in an essay um, for a project he did during, during the West, the WPA. Works Project Administration. Most of my work deals with Negroes and their lives. For more than 15 years, I have been observing the Negro population in Philadelphia. Attracted by the rich color, rhythmic movement, laughter, and religious fervor so characteristic of the race. Each one I selected because I found him or her not only typical of the race, but also revealing in character and bearing the, the complex problems which are the byproduct of life in a large, densely populated city. I have so, several uh, prints by Judith Block. And that's something I rarely do. I don't buy a lot of paintings or prints by the same artist, but I his came up pretty often and I love Judith Block. Uh, let's see, another of my favorites, Elsa Courtois, he's an African-American artist. And on this one, it's called Dance Composition Number One. It's also a print. And I went to the, to the art house specifically to buy this one, but there was another one also, the one you can see behind me by uh, Elzer, one way behind me, <laughs> Elza Quarter. And so I bought this print, got it at a good price, and then I was getting ready to leave when the next one came up. And I sat there, I said, you know what, let me just wait. And I sat there for a minute and I found that they were basically close to giving it away. When I say giving it away, the, the price was so low that I just could not, not bid on it. And so I ended up buying both of them. And I found that when I, this one is huge. And I found that when I got home and had it uh, framed and hung it, that I loved them both. I'm so glad that I got both of them. And this one's dance composition, other one's dance composition number four. And um, Elsa Corcher does a lot of uh, uh, African-American women and these long elongated face and neck and, and body. Uh, you find that a lot in his, in his works. Oh, let me, and I mentioned that I, not only collect African-American. I also collect white artists because I collect what I like. And so I'm at an uh, at, at, at auction house and I come across first, and this piece, the two totem poles like I, and I said, I said those, that, those faces look like uh, they're African. And I wanna show which group it was, but I think it's Mindy. And so I said, okay, leave it here. Then I walked two tables down and I saw this little trinket box. And I said, look, that, Face is after another one. And so I turned, turned one of them over, and the uh, signature was F server. 
So it's very, very hard to find out anything about an artist that just have your first initial and the last name. And so, and, and then I pick up, turn another piece, it was Francis. And I, it looked like Francis C-I-S, so I assume it was a man, but I find out it was Francis Cerber. She is, she was a white woman ceramicist. And I also learned that she had done this beautiful ceramic tile with another artist in the 1940s in a um, apartment house on Parkway in Philadelphia, where I had lived when I first moved to Philadelphia. I don't remember seeing that ceramic pieces, but they were still there from the 1940s when the building was first uh, built. But this is Frances Server, and with Frances Server, when I first came across her, I could find I couldn't find a lot. I did, uh, uh, Lynn, you may appreciate this. I did go to uh, I'm trying to the may have been the history museum, uh, the historical society. I saw you right, have a right, right. Historical, in your, yeah. right, historical society. <laughs> I found a file on her, and there was a a lot of information in that file on her. I was able to put that in that to the story. But then a couple of years later, uh, some of her relatives were, you know, searching for her name, came across my blog post, and I was able to interview uh, a nephew who was the family historian. And so he told me wonderful, wonderful information about Francis Server. So now, if you ever come across a, in her ceramic pieces, you don't, and you will recognize her name, and you can also find out a lot more information about who Frances Server was. Uh, she was like a bohemian type. Uh, sounds like a wonderful, wonderful woman. Margaret Burroughs. Margaret Burroughs uh, is one of those real, those uh, uh, African-American female artists that you really, really ought to know. Uh, she, excuse me, uh, from the Harlem Renaissance, and she was, she and her husband helped found at the Sable African-American Museum in Chicago. Uh, this piece, Mother Africa, even when I bought, I bought this piece at a uh, sale of a group of nuns in Bucks County. They were getting ready to close um, the donnery. And so they were moving out and, 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 and this was one of the pieces that was for sale. And one of the interesting things about this piece, what I found interesting was not only that it was Margaret Burroughs and somebody else, uh, another um, Archie Gore wanted it just as much as me, was that it had been donated, I'm looking for, donated to one of the sisters at the, uh, hold on a minute. It, it was, had been donated to Sister Beatrice Jeffries and probably by some of her students. Uh, and I thought that, you know, the combination of Margaret Burroughs, you know, female artist and this sister uh, made this, this one for me very, very special. I'm quite sure the person who was bidding against me was dying it for, was just gonna buy it for this piece, but I thought it was uh, much bigger than that. Alina mentioned Roland Ayers. Uh, the Woodmere Museum just recently in an exhibit by Roland Ayers. I bought this exhibit, this is, I'm sorry, this painting, you know, years ago. And uh, I remember I saw the, the signature R Ayers, 1976. And I assume it was, well, I wondered if it was Roy Ayers, who was a musician, African American jazz musician. And he was a painter. Then I found out it was actually Roland Ayers. And I was able to, uh, Roland, at the time I was finally able to locate him, had Alzheimer's. And so he was in a nursing home. And so I ended up talking to his wife, Sheila. And I got a lot of, lot of great information from her. She still had some of his you know, drawings from when he was a child. Uh, and, uh, and the Woodmere um, exhibit, they had a few of his paintings in color, but most of them were drawing. And one of the interesting drawings that he did was a 1987 uh, drawing of Paul Robeson for uh, Moonstone Art Center's Paul Robeson Festival, which was going on at the time. This is one of my uh, pieces I really love too, because like I said, I love color. And this one is full of color. That's Ebola Ayers. Oh, this is interesting too. Bill Howell. Bill Howell was a, an illustrator. 
and also an artist. Bill, when I first saw the Bill Howell piece, not this piece, it, in, in the book, there was this, I'm walking into the auction house and across the room, I see this uh, black background and the center is this black woman with this huge Afro. So obviously I directed, went directly to it and it wasn't signed, it was the word Kamoja. And I found out later that was named was of uh, Bill Howell's art gallery. And next to it was another piece of which is also in the book, but I didn't know it was painted by Howell until it came up for auction, the auctioneer said it. What I didn't do, and I always learned to do is that you can't see, you, you always take pieces off the wall, look on the back because you may find the artist's name, you may find out where, where it may have been exhibited, and some more is the date, the year was made, and some more information about uh, the artist. But the, these two pieces here were not in that room near the one with the Afro. I walked into another room in the Archer House, and on the table are two huge black portfolios. So I can't see what the end. So obviously I walked over and I flipped them open and I flipped and flipped the papers inside. It was obvious that, you know, this is by, by African America because they were illustrations of, you know, pantyhose, the illustration of like one on the side looked like a holiday card. And these were these were drawings and illustrations from places where he had worked. And so, and I, I'm sitting here thinking, what family throws this kind of, I'm not throwing, but to me it's like throwing. Who gives away this type of information? I mean, it was two huge port portfolios of this work. Then I, and when I do in my research, I found out that a, uh, a, an organization uh, in Atlanta had bought some of his personal papers like a couple of years before. But I, I, this is, for me, this is a treasure of, you know, uh, uh, Bill Howell, someone I had never heard of before, but who made a major contribution as an illustrator that nobody knows about. But now you know about Bill Howell. In fact, I got a, uh, an email from his son who I thought I would be able to interview, but we were never able to connect. Now, this is another one that I fell in love with. Look, I, I'm from the South. You know, I'm seeing this, it reminds me, uh, you know, a Southern scene, but it also reminded me of a photograph that I had taken of an old 40s Ford truck under a shed and while driving down on some country road in Georgia, where I'm from. And I fell in love with this. I like the detail, I like the color, you know, it's very, very earthy. You know, he went so far, James Ray Iron went so far as putting a little license plate on, on, on the side. And so I was, it, you know, I was just so enamored with this piece. And I said, you know what? Oh, I love to talk to him. So I was able to find him at a retirement home in like Virginia. And so I called him up and I, uh, I found him by Googling, you know, just Googling his name. And he primarily paints sailboats off the Chesapeake. But I was able to find him at this retirement home. I interviewed him by email. And uh, he, he just congratulated me on the fact that I have one of his early pieces. I don't know what it's worth. I have no idea. I just fell in love with this piece by James Drake Iron. And, you know, it, and he was a fine artist who, uh, it, for me, it really, really didn't matter because it was a piece that spoke to me. So I think those are all the pieces I have. Any other questions? There, there were a couple questions um, earlier um, about uh, one person wants to know if you would ever partner with the Colored Girls Museum in Philadelphia. Um, and then there's another question about um, prints versus originals. So you, you already showed some uh, prints. Uh, we looked at Margaret Burroughs and Elizabeth Catlett, but do you want to talk more about that? Uh, one thing to say is, you know, don't shun prints because uh, most of the pieces in my collection are prints because they are affordable. And an artist, like I said, artists like Charles White, Elizabeth Catlett, and you know, Margaret Burrell, white artists too. Uh, uh, the piece by uh, Judith Block is a print. I have several uh, prints by Judith Block. And they, they specifically learned printmaking, did printmaking, so people like us could afford their work. So don't shun them. If you can get a painting that you love at a price that you can afford, uh, buy it. But, but 
do buy, buy prints. And, 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 you know, even if you can only afford $25, you know, poster by Romare Bearden, it's something that you might buy. Just don't spend $200 to frame it. Uh, but you just need to put artwork on your wall that makes you feel good, that speaks to you, that, you know, uh, makes, your, makes living, you know, worth living. Um, if, I'll, I'll just do a quick uh, additional library plug. Uh, if, if for uh, history of printmaking in Philadelphia and especially local artists, African-American artists and printmaking, there's a great exhibit on the third floor right now um, okay. um, for the greatest number. And it's about various New Deal programs of the, of the New Deal, um, different federal programs of the New Deal era. But yeah, check that out. You'll see lots of prints from the Print and Pictures um, collection. Um, uh, lastly, I think we should tell them one more time where they can get your book, uh, and if they want to sign copy uh, of your book, how do they go about doing that? Yeah. Um, let me do this one more. And of course, there's a copy here in the in the library <laughs> that you can borrow, but uh, it, it's just one. <laughs> <laughs> So you can buy a book at Amazon.com, but for signed copies, you can contact me at sherry at wabwnetwork.com. And we can together make arrangements for me to get signed copies uh, for you. You know, I, one of the things we can do, I'm a volunteer at the Paul Robeson House in West Philadelphia. And I'm, you know, over there, we can always meet there and I can sign a copy and, uh, and you can buy the book. And books are $30. Uh, and you know, and people say, oh, $30. I tell them that it's only, it's a self-published book. I self publish it through Amazon, but it costs a lot because it's a book of color art. And you know, if you go, if you go to, to Staples any place, you know it costs more to make uh, color copies. But uh, but you know, contact me at Sherry at wabwnetwork.com. And I have a website for the book where you can listen to an excerpt and watch a trailer at sherryhoward.com. And uh, Leah gave you uh, the link to my blog. And I think you'll love the blog. The blog is artwork, uh, uh, and, but also there's a lot of history, white, white history, <laughs> American history. There's no such thing as white history. And it shouldn't be such thing as African American history. It should be history. At some point, we'll get to that point. That's another question. But, uh, but the blog itself includes, you know, uh, all kinds of uh, items that I found on the auction table that I found that were, had interesting histories. Things I had never heard of before because, you know, they were anachronism, would be anachronism now. Find an auction house, auctionzip.com is the place to look for, you know, auctions, but also a place to go to find uh, auction houses that can give you a quickie, um, appraisal. And sometimes that's all you want. You just want to see what things are for. And like I mentioned too, you can always do this on your own by just Googling and, and see what comes up. But just keep in mind that these are, that's a ballpark figure because what you have could cost more, it could cost less. And if you want um, an appraisal done, you know, there's a National Appraisal Association that you can find online. And, but, and I mentioned that appraisers are not cheap. Uh, they do cost money. You know, and, and before I go, let me mention another thing. And I don't think anybody asked about this is how to take care of your artwork. One of the things that uh, I tell people is, you know, don't put your artwork in the basement. If you live in Philadelphia, all of our basements are on the ground. That means that, you know, it's damp down there. Uh, I don't care if you have a dehumidifier. You know, if you have artwork that you love in the basement, bring it up out of the basement so it doesn't get molded or or or, or damp. I don't put my paper uh, watercolors and things near a window because uh, yeah, or reproduction because light will uh, fade them. And you know, and make sure you know water doesn't get near them because I the piece I have by let me show it to you here. This piece by Sam Brown, if you look, you may not be able to see it, but across the top, uh, it's a little lighter than it should be. It, and another thing too, it probably needs to be cleaned. But at some point, whoever owned that piece 
uh, allowed it to get in your water. So you can see where the water has wrinkled uh, the top of the paper. So you want, and, and, and if you see some little dark spots, I tended to think that the water also caused the watercolor paint to uh, sort of run too. So you want to be very, very careful uh, about how you take care of your artwork and, you know, dust them off sometimes, you know, clean the glass, uh, just to keep, if you're going to spend money, regardless of how much money you're going to spend, you know, take care of your artwork. And, and a lot of artwork I've bought at auction, people, you know, just didn't take care of them. And I, I really hope that you, that you will. So are there any other questions? Let's see. Um, I also shared a uh, list to, I just put together that quick catalog list that I mentioned. Um, and then it, it, there are a few books, but I'm hoping that Sherry will recommend additional books for us to add to that list. So she may have additional books about art collecting and price guides we can add on there but you'll find uh, we speak the catalog to that with me our um, exhibit that reproduces some of um the paintings that she loaned to that exhibit mm -hmm. um, lena you just you're uh you're on mute okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think I've been I've been uh, talking for a long time. Um, I was I, I muted myself so I could type so no one could hear oh, okay. Uh, okay. the typing. Uh, but I, I was just telling everyone um, that I shared a catalog list um, that has um, um, some of the some very few books right now. Some books, um, of course, this book, and then the uh, we speak the catalog to the Woodmere Art Exhibit that includes the um, uh, the the paintings that Sherry loaned for that exhibit. And um, I'm hoping that Sherry will recommend uh, additional titles for us to further recommend to people who are looking. Um, or advice on art collecting, but um, yeah, I feel like we could go all night, but it's, it's almost I seven, so. <laughs> I know, <it's> <laughs> but can I mention just one thing that one, I mentioned about the art teacher with all her artwork. And one thing I would use to tell people is, you know, decide before it's too late, what you're gonna do with your artwork or, or not only your artwork, but, but anything else of value. You, you, you should decide whether you want to sell it, or donated or, or whatever, but make sure you make provisions for uh, the things that you consider very, very valuable. And, and one, one last thing, I, uh, Alina mentioned that two of my pieces were in the Woodmere uh, exhibit a couple of years ago. What that gives me is provenance. Provenance is primarily the history of the artwork that you own, but not on the artwork, but other valuable items. Who owned it? Whether it was an exhibit, part of an anthology, in a catalog, and what that does is that it increases the value. It can, never know. It can increase the value of your artwork because that that gives it a a history that somebody else saw it. Somebody else thought it was valuable enough to include in an in exhibit or include in in an anthology. All right, um, last call for questions and um, uh, we'll, oh, I see uh, there's a couple messages here. Everybody is um, excited. Thank you, Sherry. This was an amazing presentation. Thank you, Free Library, for hosting Sherry's talk. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you, you for sharing your collection with us. What a wonderful talk. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is from, from Laura on Prince and Pictures. Looking forward to hearing from you. Yes. Um, so I hope you, you and everybody else um, looks into uh, visiting the uh, Print and Pictures collection. So get in yes. touch um, okay. with them for um, making an appointment. Um, and we'll share this recording, the recording of this um, with everybody who registered. So you'll, you'll see that in your email soon. And everybody else who registered was not able to make it. Um, that's it. Is there anything else? I want to thank everybody for showing up and listening to me on and on about what about a subject that I love intensely. I could talk all night about it. Thank you. you. Know, it's been a joy. It's been a real joy uh, 
you know, going to the auctions and collecting these pieces and finding out about the, the artists, just learning about these arts and, and, and giving them, you know, their due because they, they, they are worth it. Buy local artists. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, Sherry. Thanks, right, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I'll see you soon. Okay, bye-bye.